The Bolsheviks Come to Power by Alexander Rabinowitch. This is Chapter 7. Uh, Kornilov versus Kerensky. The deepening hostility between Kerensky and Kornilov, the increasing polarization of Russian society, and Kerensky's weakness in the prevailing situation became most apparent during the Moscow State Conference held August 12 to 14. Originally conceived by Kerensky in late July to familiarize authoritative political figures from all over Russia with the country's grave problems and to mobilize their support for the programs of the newly created Second Coalition, this conference had no actual legislative function. Among its close to 2,500 participants, the flower of the Russian population were the members of Kerensky's cabinet, top-ranking military officers, deputies from all four state dumas, and members of the executive committees of the All-Russian Congress of Workers and Soldiers Deputies and the All-Russian Congress of Peasants Deputies. Present as well were representatives of trade unions, municip municipal councils, institutions of higher learning, cooperatives, provincial zemstvos, and various and sundry congresses and committees relating to business, industry, and the armed forces. Politically, the delegates were split between liberals and conservatives, by and large staunchly supportive of Kornilov and of stringent measures to restore order, and moderate socialists who recognized the need for firm government but continued to insist on tempering repression with at least modest steps toward reform. The first group had a slight majority, noted one observant reporter. Representatives of the bourgeoisie seemed to overwhelm democratic elements. Morning coats, frock coats, and starched shirts predominate over the side-fastening Russian blouses. There were practically no spokesmen for the extreme left. The Bolshevik Central Committee initially had planned that party representatives and the all-Russian executive committees would accompany their colleagues to Moscow. The Bolshevik delegates would formally repudiate the conference at the first opportunity and then stage a walkout. When this intention became known, however, the majority socialist Soviet leadership required that all members of the Soviet conference delegation agree in advance not to speak out at the conference without specific authorization. For practical purposes, Bolsheviks going to the Moscow conference with the Soviet delegation were given the choice of accepting the positions of the majority or risking expulsion from the executive committees. Given these circumstances, the party elected to absent itself from the conference altogether. The Moscow State Conference convened in an atmosphere of tension. For several days prior to August 12th, Moscow had been rife with rumors that troops loyal to Kornilov were converging on the city and that Kornilov and his supporters were about to make a move against the government. Conference delegates arrived in Moscow to find the streets plastered with, pos with posters hailing Kornilov. A publicity brochure lauding the First People's Commander-in-Chief circulated widely. Kornilov himself was not scheduled to make an appearance at the conference until August 14th. Nonetheless, so great was the fear of a rightist coup at the con as the conferees assembled that on August 12th, the Moscow Soviet formed a six-man provisional revolutionary committee to help assure proper protection for the government and the Soviet. The seriousness with which the possibility of an attack by the right was taken at this time is indicated by the fact that the Moscow Bolsheviks, Viktor Nogin and Nikolai Muralov, along with two Mensheviks and two SRs, took an active part in the Provisional Revolutionary Committee's work. In anticipation of the conference, the extreme left-oriented Bolshevik Moscow Regional Bureau took the lead in organizing Wildcat protest strike for August 12th, the opening day. The strike was subsequently endorsed by trade union leaders, by the more conservative Bolshevik Moscow Committee, and by, and by representatives of Moscow District Soviets 
and District Bolshevik committees. By a vote of 312 to 284, however, a joint meeting of the Moscow Workers and Soldiers Soviets opposed such action. Nonetheless, on the appointed day, employees in most Moscow factories did not report for work. Many congregated instead at protest meetings. Restaurants and coffee houses were shut down. Streetcars ceased operation. And, for the most part, cab drivers were nowhere about. Even employees at the buffets in the Bolshoi Theater, where the conference met, went out on strike, forcing conference delegates to serve their own refreshments. That evening, all, Mos all Moscow was dark as employees of the gas works stayed away from their jobs. The impact of the strike bore witness to the power and sentiment of the working class and the resurgence of Bolshevik influence. A writer in the Izvestia of the Moscow Soviet, whose editorial line reflected the views of the majority socialists, conceded with embarrassment that it was time to realize that the Bolsheviks are not irresponsible groups, but one of the elements of the organized revolutionary democracy behind whom stand the broad masses, not always disciplined, but on the other hand, wholly committed to the cause of the revolution. To judge by formal deliberations at the conference, this message was lost on most delegates. At one of the early sessions, when Milikov cautioned that the demands outlined by Kornilov should not serve as cause for suspicion and voiced great fear that the government was not making sufficient provision for the restoration of order and the security of property, the Bolshoi exploded with shouts of right you are, loud bravos, and waves of applause. A similar outburst of unrestrained enthusiasm occurred in the right half of the hall when the Cossack leader, General Alexei Kaladin, declared that the survival of the state requires the continuation of the war to a victorious conclusion above all, and that the entire life of the country and all the actions of the provisional government must be subordinated to this fundamental assumption. Kaladin outlined a series of basic principles upon which the government should act, which, in essence, paralleled Kornilov's program. Amid shouts of exactly from the right and agonized cries of no from the left, Kaladin declared that the usurpation of state power by central and local committees and by the Soviets must be brought to an end immediately and abruptly. When the brilliant orator Vasily Maklakov, one of the founders of the cadet party, took the podium and implored the government to rely and believe in those at the front and to find the courage to take the daring steps necessary to lead the country forward because the judgment day is approaching, the right delegates again stood and cheered. But when Chkaidze read aloud the All-Russian Executive Committee's platform, which went a long way toward meeting liberal and conservative demands for emphasis on law and order and universal sacrifice in the interest of national defense and embodied only the most modest concessions to mass demands, these delegates sat scowling in their seats. Trying to walk a tightrope between the left and right, Kerensky in his opening address refrained from commitment to a specific program of action and typically sought salvation in strong words. Turning to the left, he thundered, let everyone who has already tried to use force of arms against the power of the people know that such attempts will be crushed with blood and iron. Turning next to the right, he roared, roared with equal vigor, an obvious reference to Kornilov and his supporters. At the same time, let those who think the time is ripe to overthrow the revolutionary government with bayonets be even more careful. I can make anyone serving me with ultimatums obey the will of the supreme power and myself as its head. Kerensky's frenzied address, at times seemingly uncontrolled and uncomfortably theatrical, lasted close to two hours. Milikov later described the event. By the expression of his eyes, which he focused on the imagined enemy, by the tense, by the tense gesturing of his arms, by the intonation of his voice, which rose to a scream for extended periods of time, 
then subsided to a tragic whisper. By his measured phrases and calculated pauses, he appeared to want to scare somebody and to create an impression of force and power. In actuality, he only engendered pity. Kornilov arrived in Moscow by train on the afternoon of August 13th. At the Alex Alexandrovsky, now the Belarusian station, his followers staged a carefully orchestrated welcome, which contrasted sharply with the cool reception accorded government ministers upon their arrival in Moscow two days earlier. As the moment for Kornilov's arrival approached, an honor guard and band from the Alexandrovsky Military Academy and a detachment from the Women's Cadet Academy posted themselves on the platform. Also on hand to greet the First People's Commander-in-Chief were a throng of ladies in gaily colored dresses, bemetalled officers by the dozen, conservative and liberal leaders participating in the state conference, a coterie of municipal authorities, and enthusiastic official deputations from all the patriotic organizations supporting Kornilov. The Moscow Women's Battalion of Death stood at attention on a viaduct overlooking the station while the mounted Cossack detachment was arrayed on the square outside. As the train slowed to a halt, Kornilov's red-robed Turkmen guards, sabers, bared, leaped to the, to the platform and posted themselves in two ranks. While the band played a fanfare and a loud cheer issued from the crowd, Kornilov, resplendent in full-dress uniform, appeared on the steps of his coach. Waving and smiling, he bounded to the platform and made his way through the lines of Turkmen's toward the waiting dignitaries. As he passed, the ladies pelted him with flowers, distributed moments earlier by some young officers. In a brief welcoming speech, the right cadet Fedor Radichev conveyed the mood of the moment. You are now the symbol of our unity, he intoned. We are unified. Indeed, all Moscow is unified in confidence in you. Save Russia and a thankful people will crown you. To be sure, at least a few of Radichev's listeners must have observed, as one reporter commented, that there were no common citizens or regular soldiers on hand. But this circumstance, not surprisingly, seems to have escaped the general's notice. Shortly after his arrival, Kornilov, seated in an open automobile at the head of a long motorcade, made a pilgrimage to the sacred Aversky Shrine, where the Tsars traditionally worshipped when they visited Moscow. After prostrating himself before the miraculous Aversky icon of the Madonna, Kornilov returned to his railway carriage. There, during the remainder of the evening and the following day, he received a stream of visitors, including a group of influential cadets led by Mulyakov, the financiers Alexei Putilov and A.I. Vishnegradsky, the notorious Purshkovich, and generals Perkovsky, Kaladin, and Alexeev. Verkovsky, who was commander of the Moscow military district, had formal responsibility for providing security to the Moscow conference, called on Kornilov to dissuade him from participating in any conspiracy against the government. After the visit, he, com he commented that Kornilov's supporters misunderstood the prevailing situation and the mood of the masses to such a degree that they seem like people who have just dropped from the moon. Cadets who visited Kornilov reflecting uh, Cadets who visited Kornilov reflecting continuing nagging doubt about the efficacy of a unilateral coup may also have urged restraint upon the general. Milikov, for one, subsequently claimed to have warned Kornilov that a clash with Kerensky was untimely, because the prime minister still had a following in the provinces. On the other hand, numerous civil and military figures sought out Kornilov in Moscow expressly to pledge their unqualified support. Most tangibly, Putilov and Vishnegradsky, representing the Society for the Economic Rehabilitation of Russia, agreed to provide the Commander-in-Chief with a substantial subsidy to help finance the establishment of an authoritarian 
exclusively non-socialist regime. Kerensky, for his part, was becoming increasingly apprehensive about Kornilov's scheduled address to the Moscow conference on August 14th. Would the general try to use the assembly to apply pressure on the government to adopt his proposals? Or worse still, would he attempt to stampede the conference into supporting his personal ambitions? In an effort to dissuade Kornilov from taking any action and to convince him to restrict his remarks at the conference to military operations and the situation at the front, Krensky dispatched his, minutes, his minister of transport, Peter Yurinev, to see Kornilov on the evening of the 13th. Dissatisfied with Kornilov's response to Yurinev, Kerensky himself telephoned the general leader that evening with the same admonition, and he repeated his plea at the Bolshoi Theater the next morning, as Kornilov was about to mount the podium. The general's reply was enigmatic, I will give my speech in my own way. To Kerensky's immense relief, Kornilov's address was relatively mild. Still, it was a hollow victory for Kerensky. As far as Kornilov was concerned, Kerensky's strictures were further confirmation, if more were needed, of the Prime Minister's weakness. Moreover, as the right roared its approval, Kornilov was followed to the rostrum by speaker after speaker whose expressed aversion to the changes wrought by the revolution and fundamental hostility toward the provisional government were by no means similarly restrained. The Moscow conference ended on the night of August 15th as a device for, uni for uniting diverse elements of Russian society behind the provisional government. It had been a total failure. Kerensky came away from the ordeal with an increased awareness of his own isolation. It is hard for me, he anguished aloud at the time, because I struggle with the Bolsheviks of the left and the Bolsheviks of the right, but people demand that I lean on one or the other. I want to take a middle road, but nobody will help me. Kerensky left Moscow with an inflated sense of support for a rightist program. The end of the Moscow conference coincided with the spreading wave of industrial fires, followed a do followed a few days later by the sudden fall of Riga. Quite apart from the pressure of Kornilov's supporters, these developments impelled Kerensky to reconsider the question of stricter civil and military controls. From this re-evaluation, Kerensky finally seems to have concluded that something on the order of the major curbs on political freedom and the thoroughgoing repression embodied in Kornilov's proposal of August 10th can no longer be delayed even if such action precipitated a decisive break with the Soviet and the masses. On August 17th, with a heavy heart, one must assume, he gave Sevenkov assurances to this effect and instructed him to draft specific decrees for action by the cabinet. Yet, if Kerensky had now moved distinctly closer to Kornilov politically, there remained a crucial difference between the two men which goes far toward explaining the events that followed. Kerensky and Kornilov each viewed himself, and not the other, as the strong man in a new authoritarian government. More than ever, each was contemptuous toward and apprehensive of the other. Kerensky was determined to use Kornilov for his own ends, while Kornilov harbored similar intentions regarding Kerensky. Meanwhile, Spurred by the Moscow conference, preparations for a coup by rightist groups at home and at the front were reaching a climax. The stage was set for a final decisive confrontation. In the wake of the Moscow conference, Kornilov continued preparations to concentrate an imposing array of troops from the front around Petrograd. The main units directed toward the capital were the 1st Don Cossack Division and the Yusurisky Mounted Division, both belonging to the Krimov's 3rd Cavalry Corps. The Russian military high command regarded these forces as among the most disciplined and politically reliable in the entire army. During the first half of August, these units had begun to move from reserve positions on the Romanian front to the Neville Novos, 
Kalniki Veliki Luki region, roughly 300 miles from Petrograd on the direct rail line. Around August 20th, the 1st Don Cossack Division was transferred to the Piskov area, half the remaining distance to the capital. Simultaneously, the equally crack Savage Division, so called because it was com it was comprised primarily of mountain tribesmen from the northern Ca northern Caucasus, whose ferociousness and cruelty in combat were legendary, was attached to the Third Corps and shipped from the southwestern front to Dino, just east of Pskov. Cossack and shock units stationed along the Baltic were earmarked for an eventual role in the pacification of the capital as well. On August 25th, General A.M. Dolgorukov, commander of the Finnish-based 1st Cavalry Corps, was called to Stavka in connection with plans to have one of his main elements, the 5th Cossack Division, advance on Petrograd from the north, while units of the 3rd Corps were moving in on the capital from the south. Among other troop relocation orders emanating from Stavka at this time was a directive to the Revel Shock Battalion of Death to proceed to Sardsko Selo. As nearly as one can piece together from scattered, sometimes contradictory evidence, an elaborate scheme for a rightist putsch in Petrograd to coincide with the approach of front troops was worked out by the main committee of the Union of Officers and the Military Section of the Republican Center and Military League. This plan appears to have been linked to a series of fundraising rallies scheduled by the Soviet leadership in Petrograd for Sunday, August 27th, the sixth month anniversary of the February Revolution. The conspirators evidently assumed that the rallies would be accompanied by disorders which could be used as a pretext for proclaiming martial law, wrecking Bolshevik organizations, dispersing the Soviet, and establishing a military dictatorship. To ensure that the occasion would not pass without suitable disturbances, the rightist press was to whip up political tension in the capital, while agitators posing as Bolsheviks were to, cir were to circulate in factories, rousing workers. The conspirators also agreed that as a last resort, they would stage a leftist rising themselves. At this point, the military forces converging on, cap on the capital would be called in to help restore order and establish a strict new regime. As the day designated for action neared, the main committee of the Union of Officers, under a variety of pretexts, concentrated inordinate numbers of pro-Kornilov officers in Petrograd. On August 22nd, the Army Chief of Staff instructed Infantry, Cavalry, and Cossack Division Headquarters on all fronts to send three officers to Mogilev, ostensibly for orientation in the handling of newly developed English trench mortars. Actually, upon their arrival at Stavka, these officers were briefed and sent on almost immediately to Petrograd. To what extent the government was aware of these activities is unclear. In early August, Kerensky had received an alarming report on the work of the Union of Officers from the SR Central Committee. After the Moscow State Conference, the Prime Minister's apprehension regarding conspiracies being hatched against him at Stavka became obsessive. At his insistence, the government resolved to forbid the Union of Officers from using staff funds to finance its, ex its activities, to remove the Union's main committee from Mogilev, and to arrest some of its most active members. The extent of Kornilov's personal involvement in and commitment to the realization of his extreme supporters' plans is also difficult to ascertain. Could Kornilov's apparent preparations to intervene directly in national politics and his support of rightist activity in the capital have stemmed from a sincere belief, encouraged by the conspirators with whom he was surrounded, that the Bolsheviks were on the verge of staging a popular rising which the government would be unable to quell? 
The evidence on this point is inconclusive. There are indications that even now Kornilov held out hope that ultimately Kerensky would recognize the need for a tougher government free of Soviet influence and, and would cooperate in its establishment. Kornilov's hope that Kerensky might prove cooperative was strengthened to some extent by discussions at Mogilev between the general and the, the deputy minister of war. Savinkov, representing the prime minister during the afternoon and evening of August 23rd and the following morning. These conversations touched on a number of sore points between Kornilov and Kerensky. A central issue was what was to be done about those provisions of Kornilov's program relating to the rear that had been rejected by Kerensky on August 10th. Um, by this time, the civil control decrees that Kerensky had asked Savinkov to prepare on August 17th had been drafted. In sum, in sum they embodied many of Kornilov's demands. Kornilov evidently expressed approval of the decrees and Savinkov voiced confidence that they would be adopted in the next few days. How the government would respond to the storm of popular protest these decrees were certain to trigger was a matter of mutual concern. Savinkov suggested, no doubt wishfully, that the Bolsheviks and perhaps also the Soviet would rebel against them and that the government would deal mercilessly with such opposition. To strengthen the government's hand as it embarked on this tough new course, Savinkov proposed that the Third Corps he be dispatched to the capital and placed at the War Ministry's disposal. He insisted, however, that for political reasons, the reactionary General Krimov be removed as commander of the Third Corps and that a regular cavalry unit be substituted for the Savage Division prior to the Third Corps' move to the capital. Kornilov agreed to these conditions at the time, although subsequently he simply ignored them. In effect, the government was sanctioning troop dispositions which the commander-in-chief had initiated some weeks earlier on his own. It was decided that Kornilov should notify Savinkov by telegraph two days before the Third Corps was in place. The government would then declare martial law in Petrograd, after which the new regulations would be issued. Savinkov and Kornilov tentatively reached this understanding at their first meeting on the afternoon of August 23rd, despite the fact that the meeting had evidently gotten off to an unpromising start. Kornilov had complained about Soviet socialists in the cabinet and had heaped abuse on Kerensky personally. Savinkov noted later that Kornilov declared directly that the provisional government was, quite simply, incapable of adopting a firm course that for every step in this direction, it was necessary to pay with a portion of the fatherland. But after Kornilov had read Savinkov's draft decrees and received authorization to send troops to Petrograd, his mood warmed considerably. Thus, when Savinkov attacked the Union of Officers and asked Kornilov to prevent his staff from aiding it materially and to make the main committee transfer its operations to Moscow, Kornilov agreed to do so. Still another potentially sticky issue now tentatively settled was whether the government or the general staff would have primary command authority over the Petrograd military district. In a telegram to Kerensky on August 19th, Kornilov had reaffirmed his desire to have troops of the Petrograd garrison placed under his direct command. Cabling the government to report on the fall of Riga a few days later, he had reiterated this demand. At the same time, Kornilov also insisted that more garrison troops be shipped to defense positions on the Northern Front. The removal of radicalized soldiers from the capital had been, of course, one of the government's goals since the July days. Consequently, the cabinet had responded with alacrity to Kornilov's demand, and the level of transfers between the capital and the front had increased significantly towards the end of August. Placing all garrison soldiers under Kornilov's control, however, was quite another matter. Kerensky later remarked that if this had been done, we could have been eaten alive at any moment. 
hence Savinkov and Mogilev, was under instructions to persuade Kornilov to accept command of the Petrograd military district, minus those troops actually in the city and its immediate suburbs. When this issue was raised midway in the savinkov kornilov talks, Kornilov agreed to Savinkov's proposal with little argument. At the close of their discussions, Savinkov questioned General Kornilov about his attitude toward the government. In response, Kornilov, with dubious sincerity, pledged loyalty to Kerensky. Still, Savinkov's visit may have led Kornilov to conclude that events were finally bringing Kerensky around to his own point of view, and hence that it might not be necessary to utilize force against the government. In any case, Kornilov had every reason to be relieved and encouraged. If there were further problems in establishing a strong national government in Petrograd, in which the influence of Soviet socialists would be eliminated and the army would have the leading voice, reliable troops under the uncompromising Krimov soon would be in a position to deal with them. The meetings in Mogilev must also have been reassuring to Savinkov. Kornilov and Kerensky, it seemed, were finally about to act in concert to re-establish order, the goal that Savinkov had sought all along. There, appear, there appeared to be hope that the threat of Bolshevism and meddling by the Soviet would soon be ended and that Russia would proceed with the primary task of restoring the war effort. On the evening of August 24th, shortly after Savinkov's departure for Petrograd, General Krimov received instructions from Kornilov to push on to Petrograd upon receiving word of a Bolshevik rising. <clears throat> he then left Mogilev to be with his soldiers. The following day, the Third Corps was placed on alert and Krimov drafted a directive to be distributed by the Corps upon its entry into the capital. In this order, Krimov placed the entire Petrograd military district, including Finland and Kronstadt, under strict martial law. A curfew was imposed between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. With the exception of groceries and pharmacies, all commercial enterprises were ordered closed. Strikes and meetings of any kind were forbidden. Civilians possessing firearms were to turn them in immediately. Strict censorship of all periodicals was proclaimed. Persons caught violating any of these regulations, with the exception of the censorship, censorship rule, were to be shot. I warn everybody, Krimov cautioned in the directive, that by the instructions of the commander-in-chief, the troops will not fire into the air. That night, August 25th, Krimov received supplementary orders to begin his move northward on the morrow. In this connection, the Northern Front Commander, General Klimbovsky, was instructed that the Usuriski Mounted Division, still in the Veliki Luki region, was to be placed aboard trains which would proceed to the capital via Piskov, Narva, and Krasno, or Krasno Selo. Simultaneously, the other main elements of the Third Corps, the Savage Division at Dno, and the 1st Don Cossack Division at Piskov, were to embark for the suburban towns of Sartsko, Selo, and Gechina, respectively. Moreover, each of the major units of the Third Corps received specific assignments in connection with the military occupation of Petrograd. The Savage Division, in spite of Kornilov's promise to Savinkov that it would not be sent to Petrograd, was to occupy the Moscow, Litany, mm -hmm. Alexander Nevsky, and Rostis. Rostesvensky districts. Disarm workers and all troops of the Petrograd garrison, except the personnel of cadet academies. Organize guard and patrol duty. Assume responsibility for guarding prisons. Take charge of railroad stations. And, utilizing whatever force was required, crush any and all disturbances and incidents of disobedience. At the same time, Kornilov dispatched the pre-arranged telegram to Savinkov. The Corps will be in place in the suburbs of Petrograd by evening of August 28th. 
a request that Petrograd be proclaimed under martial law on August 29th. In Petrograd at this time, while Savinkov was preparing to bring his new civil control decrees to a vote in the cabinet, right extremists, either oblivious to the arrangements worked out between Savinkov and Kornilov, or simply ignoring them, doggedly continued to set the stage for a putsch. The rightist press trumpeted daily warnings of left-inspired massacres, which allegedly would take place on the 27th. In the Soviet majority, or in the Soviet majority socialists and Bolsheviks alike were troubled by a rash of reports of insurrectionary appeals to workers made by strangers in soldiers' tunics. At this juncture, there occurred a startling series of events which shattered all illusions that Kornilov and Kerensky would work together and simultaneously undermined preparations for a putsch. It began with a meeting at the Winter Palace on August 22nd between Kerensky and Vladimir Nikolaevich Lvov, a well-meaning though naive and muddle-headed busybody who had been a liberal deputy in the Third and Fourth Dumas and had served without distinction as chief procurator of the Holy Synod in the First and Second post-February cabinets. Lavov shared the conviction of many industrial, business, and agrarian leaders in Moscow, with whom he had ties, that Russia's survival was dependent on the creation, by peaceful means, of a law and order-directed national cabinet, which would include representatives of all major patriotic groups. Unlike many of Kornilov's avid supporters, however, Lavov retained a measure of respect for Kerensky, with whom he had become acquainted in the Duma and the cabinet. He assumed that both Kerensky and Kornilov were working selflessly toward the same end, the establishment of an authoritarian regime. Hearing with alarm of the preparations afoot at Stavka to seize power, Lvov thought it his duty to do what he could to help avert a clash between the Prime Minister and the Commander-in-Chief. Casting himself in the role of intermediary between the two men, Lvov hastened to Petrograd, where he gained an interview with Kerensky on the evening of August 22nd. Affirming mysteriously that he had come on behalf of certain groups with significant strength, Lvov painted a bleak picture of the government's situation and volunteered to sound out key political figures, presumably starting with Kornilov, regarding the basis upon which a national government might be formed. If one is to believe Lvov's memoir account of this conversation, Kransky responded by giving him full authority to conduct political negotiations on his behalf, even suggesting his willingness to step down as Prime Minister. Kransky later denied vehemently um, I lost my spot. Kerensky later denied vehemently Lvov's version of the conversation and suggested a different interpretation. Suspecting from the start that Lvov was involved in a conspiracy and seeing in his proposal an opportunity to smoke out his enemy's intentions, he had not opposed Lvov's undertaking in formal soundings, nothing more. The more plausible of the two accounts, it would seem, is Kerensky's. There is no other evidence that Kerensky was at any time genuinely willing to share power with Kornilov. Moreover, in view of Kerensky's continuing obsession with conspiracies against him, the use of Lvov for intelligence purposes had a certain logic. <laughs> As to Lvov's version, it is difficult to say whether, in his enthusiasm, he misunderstood Kerensky, or whether carried away by self-importance and a sense of urgency, he consciously exceeded his authority and then sought to conceal the fact. Um, at any rate, Lvov left Petrograd at once, and after stopping briefly in Moscow, where he circulated word that Kerensky was amenable to the reconstruction of the government, the creation of a national cabinet, and if necessary, his own resignation, he boarded the next available train to Moglev, arriving at Stavka on August 24th. From the outset of the conversations with Kornilov, 
Laval very likely conveyed the impression that he had been empowered by Kerensky to help from a new cabinet. Um, I lost my place again. What the fuck? To help from a new cabinet. With or without Kerensky's participation. Sorry. Meeting with Kornilov initially on the evening of August 24th, he invited the general to state his position on the character and makeup of a new government. Kornilov's initial response to this approach was non-committal, in part, no doubt, because he had not yet consulted Navoyko. It is clear, however, that to Kornilov, and even more to extremists like Zavoyko, Lvov's appearance at Stavka, coming as it did on the heels of Savinkov's visit, was a further indication of Kerensky's weakness and readiness to compromise. Significantly, Zavoyko and other rightist leaders in Mogilev now began intense, open discussions of candidates for ministerial posts in a new government. Kornilov, accompanied this time by Zavoyko, did not mince words when he made his demands known to Lvov at their second meeting. On August 25th, Petrograd would have to be placed under martial law, he stated. The commander-in-chief of the army, whoever he might be, would have to be given supreme civil as well as military authority everywhere in the country. In the new government, Kornilov went on, there would be room for Kerensky as Minister of Justice and Savinkov as Minister of Defense. For their own protection, he urged that both men come to Mogilev no later than August 27th. According to Lvov, when Kornilov mentioned Kerensky as a possible Minister of Justice, Novoyko, in a tone that teachers use towards pupils, bluntly rejected the idea, proposing instead that Kerensky be named Deputy Prime Minister. That these terms did not strike Lvov as outlandish testifies strongly to his simple-mindedness. He responded by suggesting only that leading cadet, business, and industrial figures be invited to Moglev to, to participate in the formation of a new cabinet. Nevertheless, some remarks made by Zavoyko, as Lvov was about to board the train for the return trip to Petrograd, raised doubts in his mind about Kerensky's probable fate in the event that he actually placed himself in Stavka's hands. Zavoyko had said casually, Kerensky is needed as a name for the soldiers for 10 days, or so after which he will be eliminated. Later on the afternoon of the 26th, weary but apparently undeflated by the results of his negotiations, Lvov was back in the Winter Palace to report to Kerensky. Shortly before Lvov was admitted to see the Prime Minister, Savinkov had confidently assured Kerensky that Kornilov would support him in every way possible. This helps explain Kerensky's reaction when Lvov officiously enumerated Kornilov's terms, insisted that they be brought before the government at once, and compassionately implored Kerensky to quickly set as much distance as possible between himself and Petrograd in the interest of sparing his life. Thinking Lvov was joking, the Prime Minister erupted in laughter. This is not a time for jokes, Lvov interjected, begging Kerensky to yield to Kornilov. Kerensky was later to acknowledge that, that at this point he found himself pacing back and forth in his study, unable to absorb what was happening. In a state of shock, he suggested that his visitor put Kornilov's demands in writing, which Lvov promptly did. Moreover, seeking further confirmation of Kornilov's treachery and a firmer basis upon which to initiate action against him, Krensky arranged to converse directly with Kornilov by teleprinter. What followed was at once one of the most tragic, ludicrous, and by now familiar moments in 1917 Russian politics. The episode is sufficiently illuminating to warrant its reproduction in some detail. 
To converse directly with Kornilov, it was necessary to utilize the communications equipment in the war ministry. Lvov agreed to meet Kerensky there at least past eight. Lvov was late for the appointment, but this did not deter the prime minister, now close to hysteria. He put through the call to Kornilov and simply pretended that Lvov was by his side. Kerensky. Good day, General. VN Lvov and Kerensky at the apparatus. We beg you to confirm the statement that Kerensky is to act according to the communication made to him by, by Vladimir Nikolaevich. Kornilov. Good day, Alexander Fedorovich. Good day, Vladimir Nikolaevich. Confirming again the description of the present situation of the country and the army as it appears to me, which I requested the end to convey to you, I declare again that the events of the past days and of those that I can see coming imperatively demand a definite decision in the shortest possible time. Kerensky, I, Vladimir Nikolaevich, ask you whether it is necessary to act on that definite decision which you asked me to communicate privately to Kerensky. Without your personal confirmation, Alexander Fedorovich hesitates to give me his full confidence. Kornilov, Yes, I confirm that I asked you to convey to Alexander Fedorovich my urgent plea that he should come to Moglev. Kerensky, I, Alexander Fedorovich, understand your answer as confirmation of the words conveyed to me by VN. To do that and leave here today is impossible. I hope to depart tomorrow. Is it necessary for Savinkov to go? Kornilov, I beg urgently that Boris Viktorovich shall come with you. What I said to Vienne refers in equal degree to Savinkov. I beg you earnestly not to put off your departure later than tomorrow. Believe me, only my recognition of the responsibility of the moment makes me so persistent in my request. Krensky, shall we come only in case of an outbreak of which there are rumors? Or in any case, Kornilov, in any case, Kerensky, goodbye, we shall soon see each other. Kornilov, goodbye. One can easily imagine the unrestrained glee at Stavka that must have followed this conversation. Hopes were raised that Kerensky would submit without a struggle to the construction of a new government under Kornilov. Meanwhile, Kerensky's worst fears seemed about to, be, about to materialize. Although the conversation by teleprinter had verified concretely only that Kornilov wanted Kerensky and Savinkov to come to Moglev, Kerensky now concluded that he had been double-crossed and that Stavka was bent on dispensing with him entirely. A jumble of thoughts rushed through his mind. He had shifted during the past week to a rightward course, which, if fully revealed, would be gravely compromising in the eyes of the moderate socialists. Would it be realistic, then, to rely on their support in a conflict with Kornilov? And how would the volatile Petrograd masses, the very elements he had hoped to suppress, react to this new crisis? No doubt they could be mobilized to fight Kornilov. But would, but would this not lead naturally to a rejuvenation of the left? In combating Kornilov, would he not be defeating himself and dealing a further blow to hopes of restoring order and the fighting capacity of the army? With such considerations in mind, Kerensky seems to have concluded that the wisest course of action was to forestall Kornilov's sympathizers in the cabinet from attempting to compromise with the general at his expense and to keep the left uninformed about the developing crisis, while at the same time removing Kornilov as commander-in-chief before the Third Corps reached the outskirts of Petrograd. In fact, for almost 24 hours, Kerensky's imbroglio with Kornilov was not disclosed to the press or even to the Soviet leadership. Late on the night of August 26th, after having Lvov arrested and locked in a back room of the Winter Palace, Kerensky consulted with Nekrasov, his closest associate, as well as with Savinkov and other high officials of the War Ministry. He then interrupted a cabinet meeting in the Malachite room. It is ironic that the ministers were in the process of discussing Savinkov's decrees and broke the news of Kornilov's treachery. 
As proof, he read aloud the tape of his conversation with the general and circulated it for all to see. Kerensky next requested his fellow ministers to grant him unlim unlimited authority to deal with the emergency as he saw fit. He observed that the developing situation might require a restructuring of the cabinet. In view of what was to follow, it appears that Kerensky was considering the possible creation of a directory, a powerful national executive body composed of less than a half dozen top leaders, like the one that existed in France from 1795 to 1799. Information about what happened next is murky. Apparently, the cadets Kokoshkin and Yurnev, long since disgruntled with Kerensky's leadership and apprehensive that he would misuse extraordinary powers, vehemently expressed their opposition, threatening to resign if his, pro if his proposal were granted. The majority of the cabinet, however, supported the prime minister, and to give him a completely free hand in forming a new government, they dutifully tendered the resignations. Kerensky apparently accepted the resignations but requested the cabinet members to remain at their posts as acting ministers pending construction of a new government. Only Kokoshkin refused to stay on. This last official meeting of the Second Coalition dragged on until close to 4 a.m. on August 27th. Upon its conclusion, Kerensky dispatched a terse telegram to Kornilov commanding him to yield his post to the Chief of Staff, General Lukomsky, and to proceed at once to Petrograd. <laughs> Upon reception of the cable in Mogilev four hours later, a dumbfounded Lukomsky immediately wired back. It is too late to halt an operation started with your approval. In order to save Russia, you must go along with Kornilov. Kornilov's dismissal would bring horrors the likes of which Russia has never seen. I cannot accept General Kornilov's post. Lukomsky's response, of course, dashed Kerensky's hope of quickly removing Kornilov and preventing the conflict from erupting openly. Moreover, the front troops dispatched by Kornilov were continuing their advance toward Petrograd. Hence, by midday, August 27th, Kerensky had begun to make plans for the defense of the capital. In this connection, he ordered that Petrograd be placed under martial law and that Savinkov, who could be counted on to struggle with the extreme left as well as with Kornilov, be installed as Governor General of Petrograd in overall charge of military preparations. Kerensky also prepared a public announcement on the crisis the release of which was delayed several hours while first Savinkov and then Maklikov tried unsuccessfully over the teleprinter to persuade Kornilov to step down. In the meantime, Kerensky sought to divert Kornilov's troops from the capital. I order that all echelons moving toward Petrograd and its outskirts be stopped and redirected to their previous stations. Petrograd is completely calm and no insurrections are expected stated the cable, which he now sent to, among others, the commanders of the Northern Front and the Third Corps and, and Kornilov. The order fell on deaf ears, and so in the early evening, Kerensky's announcement was made public and a copy sent to Kornilov. All things considered, the proclamation was relatively restrained. The movement of hostile troops from the front toward the capital was not mentioned. The public was simply informed that Kornilov had dispatched Lvov to the provisional government with a demand for the surrender of all civil and military power, that this act reflected a desire on the part of certain circles to establish a regime opposed to the conquests of the revolution, and that in view of this, the government had empowered Kerensky to take prompt and resolute countermeasures. Among these, it was announced, were the firing of Kornilov and the proclamation of martial law in Petrograd. As the poet Zaneda Gippius speculated in her diary at the time, Kornilov's initial reaction to this announcement must have been that someone had gone completely mad. The next moment, he must have been enraged. Kornilov had neither sent Lvov nor, to his mind, threatened the government. Late that night, Zavoyko drafted an impassioned 
if typically ineptly worded response, which was sent to all military commanders and read immediately to reporters. It stated in part, the first portion of the minister president's telegram is full of lies. It was not I who sent Vladimir Lavov to the provisional government, but he who came to me as the envoy of the minister president. Thus a great provocation has taken place, which jeopardizes the fate of the motherland. People of Russia, our great motherland is dying. The hour of her death is near. Forced to speak openly, I, General Kornilov, declare that under the pressure of the Bolshevik majority in the Soviets, the provisional government acts in complete harmony with the plans of the government of the German general staff and simultaneously with the forthcoming landing of the enemy forces on the coast of Riga. It is killing the army and undermines the very foundation of the country. The heavy sense of the inevitable ruin of the country commands me in this ominous moment to call upon all Russian people to come to the aid of the dying motherland. I, General Kornilov, son of a Cossack peasant, declare to all and each that I want nothing for myself except the preservation of a great Russia, and I vow to bring the people by means of victory over, over the enemy to a constituent assembly where they themselves will decide their fate and choose their new form of government. August 27th, 1917, signed General Kornilov. After issuing this declaration of war, Kornilov instructed his subordinates to continue the movement of troops along the rail lines to Petrograd. For the time being, the general's confidence that troops of the Third Corps would follow their commanders appeared justified. On August 27th, echelons of the Savage Division boarded trains at Dano to begin their advance on the capital. The next morning, led elements of the division named Viritsa. Meanwhile, the Usuriski Mounted Division, having reached Peskov, was continuing on to Narva Yamburg while the 1st Don Cossack Division had moved from Beskov to Luga. A significant portion of the military high command now quickly registered solidarity with Kornilov. Among those to do so were Generals Klombovsky and Beluev, commanders of the Northern and Western Fronts, respectively. General Skrbatov, Deputy Commander of the Romanian Front, and General Denikin, commander of the Southwestern Front, the latter wired Kerensky. At a conference with members of the provisional government on July 16th, I pointed out that by virtue of a whole series of military enactments, the government had ruined and, ruined and corrupted the army and trampled our campaign banners in the mud. Today I received word that General Kornilov proposing certain demands which could still save the country and the army is being removed from the post of Commander-in-Chief. Viewing this as the government's return to its former policy of the systematic destruction of the army, and consequently of the country, it is my duty to inform the government that I will not join it in this course. The main committee of the Union of Officers circulated telegrams to all army and naval headquarters proclaiming that the provisional government could no longer remain at the head of Russia and urging officers everywhere to be tough and unflinching in their support of Kornilov. On August 28th, prices on the Petrograd Stock Exchange shot upward in anticipation of a victory by Kornilov. To many government officials, Kerensky's situation appeared hopeless. Typical of the ominous reports, which were now in circulation, was a telegram to Tereshenko, from the foreign ministry's representative in Mogilev. Prince Grigory Trubetskoy reported Prince Grigory Trubetskoy reported Trubetskoy. A sober appraisal of the situation forces us to admit that the entire commanding personnel, the overwhelming majority of the officers, and the best combat units in the army will follow Kornilov. In the rear, the entire Cossack host the majority of the military schools and the best combat units will go over to Kornilov's side. Added to this physical strength is the superiority of the military organization over the weakness of the government organs. The majority of the popular and urban masses have grown indifferent to the existing order and will submit to any cracking of the whip. Subsequent events would reveal how mistaken was this estimate of the situation. 
Almost from the start of the Kornilov crisis, socialist leaders, with a better sense of the mass mood, were confident that the forces bent on the creation of a strong military dictatorship would ultimately be rebuffed. It even may be, as Sukhanov recalls, that among some political leaders with close ties to workers and soldiers, news of Kornilov's advance brought a sense of relief, excitement, exultation, and the joy of liberation. Hopes were raised that the revolutionary democracy might take new heart and the revolution might swiftly find its lawful course. But this mood was scarcely Kerensky's, as Kornilov's columns, led by Krimov, appear to have Petrograd in a vice, and as the forces of the right and left seemed poised for a head-on clash, the Prime Minister finally grasped the depth of his own isolation. Caught between two fires and expecting reprisals, regardless of who won, Krensky despaired. It appeared virtually certain that his political career was at an end.